Well, it's nine months now since I started building the Bearhawk aircraft. It's time for another update, so come and take a look. So at the end of last month, I had the engine cowls on and they were largely finished. I also had the boot cowls in place. The boot cowls have come off, the engine cowls have come off, and I've just spent some time finishing up the engine baffles. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, this is a Vans baffle kit. It's very good, but I did have to customize uh, these front baffles here, and there's quite a lot of work went into those. They're now pretty much ready uh, to be either painted or anodized, and I anticipate taking them off in the next week or two and getting that done. So this is the lower engine cowl sitting up on some trestles, and you can see here that I've cut an opening into the lower engine cowl, and that's to fit the fuel servo and the filtered air box through. That will protrude slightly through and hang out the bottom of the cowling. Now to cover that I have actually bought the fiberglass molding from Vans and that's off an RV6. That needs to be trimmed right down. There's quite a lot of work to go in there actually because I have to fiberglass a new lip on it. But that's then going to cover the filtered air box. So I spent quite a lot of time assembling the fuel servo, bolting it into place, and then assembling this filtered air box. So the air filter sits inside there, is designed so that it can bolt into place and be easily removed to change the air filter. This is also where the mixture cable connects up and on the other side, the throttle cable connects there as well. This one here is the propeller cable and that comes up and attaches to a mounting block on the front air baffle. So here you can see the detail in these front air baffles. It took uh, days and days of work making these uh, curved areas to smooth the airflow as it comes in. And I also decided to put a uh, top covering baffle right across there so that this will seal against the top cowling once the uh, cowling doors are closed. So previously I already had the cabin heat controls installed in the panel. There's one on each side and these control the openings down the bottom of the firewall here. What I've done now is I've hooked these up and they're fully operational. I've also connected up the parking brake. Here you can see the Grove Park Brake Valve. It's fully operational, connected to the park brake control. I've secured it with that blue P-clamp or a Dell clamp there. And uh, I'll probably add one more. The reason is that if there was to be any slippage in there, it could potentially revert to the on position in flight. So during the last month, I've spent quite a lot of time going through the brake system and completing it. Previously, I had all the brake hoses already installed to the master cylinders. I did a final connection to the brake calipers. You can see the hard line here where it exits the gear leg and comes into the AN fitting. What remained to be done with the brake system was to fit the Adele clamps to hold that 3003 hard aluminium line in place. That's all done now. The brake system's right ready to receive the fluid into the reservoir. So several weeks ago, the remote oil mounting bracket arrived that was originally destined to go on the engine firewall, but I discovered that it goes, uh, it mounts far better onto the engine mount right here. It gives room for the cowling doors to close and it clears the lower cowling as well. So what I've done is I've fashioned up this small aluminium bracket in here that's secured by Adele frames, uh, clamps to the engine frame and it mounts very, very well. I then had these oil hoses made up at a hydraulic workshop and they fit perfectly. So here you can see the oil line that comes from the oil filter down to the oil cooler. And this one's the exit line that runs back up to the engine. Before I mounted the oil cooler in place, I sealed the inside of the oil cooler mounting plenum. I've also had some of the fuel lines made up and you can see this fuel line here where it exits through the firewall. And I've decided to run that around the top of the oil cooling plenum and it goes into the other side of the fuel pump here. You might be able to see in the back here a vertical clear tube, and that's an overflow uh, fuel tube running out of the fuel pump. So I've mounted that. I haven't secured the bottom end of it yet. Beside that, this one here the, is, is a small flexible line that takes the pressure, that's for the fuel pressure line running up to a pressure transducer. Now I've got two transducers mounted up here, one for fuel pressure and one for oil pressure. And here on the other side of the engine, you can see the oil pressure line, and that runs up and across to the oil pressure transducer. Just over here is the manifold pressure takeoff. I've secured that in place and I made a firewall penetration for that. The actual manifold pressure transducer is gonna be mounted on the cabin side of the firewall. One thing that I had intended to do for a long time but hadn't actually gotten around to was to fit the split pins into these nuts that hold the wheels uh, onto the axle. Now, 
in between times I've mounted the engine so it became slightly more difficult and I decided to use it as an exercise just to see how I was going to lift the aircraft. What I did was I attached the hydraulic hoist to one side of the engine mount at a time and I lifted off there and it worked very very well. It just uh, lifted the wheel a couple of inches clear of the floor and I was able to un actually undo the nuts just by hand, slide them off and then I drilled and pinned those axle uh, nuts. In my last video update, the front seats were sitting at the upholsterers. They've been finished and I was waiting on the back seat. I've picked them up since. Very, very happy with how they've come out. Take a look. They're very plain and simple. They've got a little bit of orange detailing around the edge of the seats here and they're very, very comfortable to sit in. I've tried them out, trust me. So I've got the, the back seat here in place. It's just sitting in place. I haven't actually uh, put the mounts in yet. And the other thing that I've done is uh, last week I added the carpet. So I, I went down to the local rubber supplier and I found that they had a very lightweight carpet. I think it's for garage floors, pools, that kind of thing. It was extremely light and I bought four square meters of it. What I then did is I took the floor panels out of the bear hawk, flipped them upside down and uh, used some Clecos to clamp them together and then ran a carpet knife around the outside. It worked very, very well. I've got a really good fit. So that's one piece of carpet that runs under the back seat, under the front seats, and it terminates just under the front of the front seats. And then I've got a separate piece of carpet for the front cabin area. So about two weeks ago, I made up one of the first fuel sight gauges for the Bear Hawk. I've still got to make another one, and that's probably a job for this afternoon. I'll show you how I went about so it. I went down to the local aluminium store here in Christchurch, and I purchased some of this uh, caravan or camper van awning track. So it's designed to have a rope sewn into the awning and pulled through the gap here. And then what I did is I cut off this flange. That left me with this round tube with a slot right down one side that I was able to thread the clear uh, PVC tube through. And then I used some of the AN fittings and simply pressed them into place. What I did discover is that using a threaded AN fitting um, with the opening on the tube, didn't seal it properly and I was getting leaks. Eventually this will be installed up here in the wing root. So if I zoom across the cabin to the right hand side wing root panel, you can see that I've fabricated these small aluminium panels. And the forward one is a mount for the ELT switch. The top three holes are mounts for the headset jacks. And on the rear panel, the top two holes are mounts for the passenger headset jacks in the back seat. I've got the same thing on the left-hand side as well, albeit without the ELT switch mount. So this is now viewed from the other side, and you can see what I've done here is I actually wrapped that aluminium panel around the tube, and it grips onto the tube. It's still very much a work in progress, but what I'm going to do is put some roof nuts in the inside of this top tube here. It's not structural, and then I'm going to simply screw these panels in place. They'll also become uh, mounts for the fuel sight gauge. So these last two weeks, I've been doing a lot of cabling, both firewall forward and in the avionics bay. Now, what I did is I purchased mostly pre-made uh, wiring looms from Advanced Flight Systems. Now, Advanced Flight Systems is a division of Dynon Avionics. I bought the screens and uh, all of the avionics kit from Dynon, and uh, Advanced Flight Systems made up and bench tested the wiring loom. So when it came time to install them, it was very, very straightforward. Uh, it took about 20 minutes to plug them all in, literally, and uh, I was then able to fire the screens up. And uh, what I did to, to do that was I simply got some jumper leads and hooked them up to the battery, and they burst into life. Then I went around and added the network cables, and things like the GPS came online, the transponder, uh, the Adahars unit, etc. I'll give you a closer look from the top down. Right, so this is looking down on top of the avionics bay. So here you can see the Dynon's advanced control module. Now, originally, up until a couple of days ago, I had that mounted just here where my hand is. The problem was going to be, as a friend of mine pointed out, that once I put this boot cowl panel in place, it was going to be quite difficult to access underneath to change plugs. So what I've done is I've lowered that down there, and I can now access it very easily from underneath the, um, the console area. This here is the Adahars unit. Over here is the engine management system. Transponder, remote VHF, and the ADSB. This one here is uh, the intercom, and beside the intercom is the VHF radio head. And if I zoom out a wee bit, you can see the screens.
So forward of the firewall, I started to run the cabling around here. In fact, this is all secured in place now with Adele clamps. That's for the cylinder head temperature probes and the exhaust gas temperature probes. I haven't actually connected them at the moment. One reason is uh, I, I want to wait until the exhausts are in place and make it much easier to fit them. Again, this was a pre-made wiring loom. I simply had to get the ends of the cables crimped on. It was a very easy job to do. Over here, you can see what is... Uh, Quite the work in progress and this is the second wiring loom out of the engine management system and this is all the inputs um, for things like temperatures and pressures so what i've been doing <laughs> actually it's quite satisfying to to uh, when you want to pair these wires up is to put one end in an electric drill pull it slightly tight and then put the drill on and it winds them into a very nice uh, tightly wrapped wiring loom so i i, I put a firewall penetration just in up here um, it's got the other half to go in place and there'll be a couple of grommets fit in there as well. And that will secure these wires through the, through the firewall quite well. And then what I've done, I, I've just wrapped these uh, paired lines together. Some are for the uh, fuel and oil pressure transducers. And there's a few other things. I've run one down here. One's coming down to the, there's the fuel transducer. I received these three firewall penetration eyeball sockets for the control cables from Vans last week. So I've gone ahead and fitted those. That then allowed me to permanently mount the engine controls in place. So a couple of weeks ago, I realized that in order to go any further with the avionics, I was actually going to have to install these Dynon uh, HDX Skyview screens. So I went ahead and did that. Um, I had had them installed previously, so they went in quite easily and uh, I then connected the wiring looms up at the rear. Once it was all connected up and ready to go, it was simply a matter of adding the battery to the system. And uh, as it turned out, I had a battery and I bought some jumper leads. So this is the master switch that controls the left PFD and that's the avionics switch that controls the radio and the right PFD. Here it is with the displays running. Come and take a look. So I've been playing around with the Dynon display, as you can imagine, uh, like a kid in a candy store, um, setting up some of the engine parameters and just configuring this uh, lower engine bar here. Uh, you can pull up uh, engine on the offside page. You can split the screen like, like is done now. You can have the engine, uh, engine instrument readouts across the bottom bar, or you can go to a full screen as well. It's actually quite nice and reasonably intuitive too. So there's full screen there. That's still with the engine bar on the bottom, or you can get rid of the, uh, the bar down the bottom as well. So that's full screen PFD. Uh, you can go to full screen moving map display as well. I don't have full terrain database uh, loaded up at this stage. I've just got the low resolution system that comes with it. One thing that I really like, one feature is that the radio is fully integrated with the Dynon display. So what you can do, for instance, is go in here and pull up the comm radio. You can do all your tuning off the screen and push it straight across and you'll see the frequencies change up there. Not that I anticipate using that, but the reason that's a huge advantage is because the database for the maps comes preloaded with all the frequencies. So most of the time, you don't actually have to select the frequency, you simply swap it across to the on-site tuning. Another really handy feature with the Dynon display is the ability to simply pull up the advanced control module that controls all the avionics and you can see here exactly what's going on the audio panel is on you can select it off and it will uh, detect a fault straight away um, that's probably not the way that you'd use it in practice but if it developed a fault it will tell you straight away and it will tell you where the fault is and you can then cancel the fault and select it back on so you probably remember from last month, we'd had a small issue with the exhaust not quite fitting correctly inside the cowling. I'd packaged that up, sent it back to the States, and uh, Clint at Betterman Exhaust has now received it about three weeks ago. Um, they've been working on the exhaust, but they are, um, Clint explained to me, it was taking a little bit longer because they were waiting on some supplies. They were hoping to have it finished today, actually, and back in the courier system back down here to uh, Christchurch in New Zealand. Once we receive that, we'll uh, mount it permanently on the engine and can proceed with the lower cowling. So there's another month of progress on the Bearhawk. I'm still thoroughly enjoying it. Toward the end of this month, I hope to have 
all of the firewall forward wiring completed and all the avionics wiring completed. I am going to enlist a little bit of help um, for that. Now, since I've started reading all the wiring diagrams and laying out and pairing up all the wires, I probably could do it quite easily myself, actually, just by buying the correct tools and proceeding with it. But it's one of those areas that I don't have anyone double check my work. So I've got the local avionics workshop booked in to come and help me with that. Then I know it's done properly. The, the pre-made wiring looms from Dynon and Advanced Flight Systems have been absolutely brilliant. So that should be done by the end of this month. A couple of other areas that I'm going to um, continue working on is the filtered air box under the throttle servo unit and also the air intake. There's still quite a lot of work to be done there. Incidentally, if you're interested in seeing a lot more detail about what I'm doing here, I do run an online build log. It's not an instructional how-to guide or anything like that. It's simply just a log of what I do on a daily basis. I update it every night and it's at the URL address webuildplanes forward slash Neville. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. I'll do another update in a month.